The Sargo class, along with the related preceding Salmon class, are often referred to as the first US fleet submarines, although some others contend that they are actually the penultimate designed before the first true fleet submarine, but you know, take it as you will. In any case, Seawolf was the last of the class, laid down at the end of September 1938 and launched in mid-August 1939 from the Portsmouth Navy Yard in Maine, and commissioned at the end of the same year. Since the US wasn't yet involved directly in World War II, the submarine spent the first months of 1940 conducting a shakedown cruise off the US East Coast, before being assigned to the Pacific Fleet and based in San Diego. By autumn of 1941, though, she and a number of other new submarines were dispatched to the Asiatic Fleet, then based in the Philippines, in an effort to reinforce US formations in the area as tensions with Japan were increasing. This meant that she was on frontline duty from day one when Japan opened the Pacific campaign with the attack on Pearl Harbor, along with multiple attacks across Southeast Asia. Able to get out to sea before Japanese air attack could get her in port, Seawolf immediately began hunting. Unfortunately, as a modern submarine, only about a year in commission, she was armed with the latest and greatest in US underwater weaponry, the Mark 14 torpedo. So when she ran into the seaplane carrier Sanyo Maru less than a week into the war, the torpedo that hit the ship didn't explode. As the campaign above her was rapidly turning into a disaster, Seawolf punctuated the expenditure of Mark 14s with a supply run to US forces on Corregidor before being forced to drop back to the Dutch East Indies. More Japanese transports were attacked, but still the torpedoes generally refused to do their job. On occasion, though, one would explode, at least to some degree or another. The most notable during this period was when she came across the small cruiser Naka, which was leading the Christmas Island invasion fleet. After the expenditure of six more torpedoes, one finally agreed that it would both hit and explode, damaging the 5,000-ton cruiser enough to send her back to Japan for a year of repairs. A mix of luck, some improvements to some of the features of the Mark 14, and the use of the older Mark 10s in mid to late 1942 saw Seawolf's luck improve somewhat, bagging at least eight significant targets, a mixture of tankers, freighters and troop transports, along with an old destroyer that the Japanese had turned into a patrol boat, and a number of small wooden sampans which were destroyed by the 3-inch deck gun, as the latter were both too small to waste a torpedo on, and frankly of such shallow draft that any torpedo fired probably would have run straight underneath them without hitting anything anyway. The occasional dud continued to dog the ship's performance, though, with several significant-sized targets escaping with just some dented hull plating as a result. One particularly frustrating attack was launched over three days and nights at a six-ship convoy that had a single escort. Seawolf managed to land torpedo hits on the escorting torpedo boat, the Coco Maru, the Shoto Maru, the Durban Maru, and the Fusé Maru. But a combination of duds, partial or premature explosions and various other circumstances, meant that only the cargo ship Shoto Maru actually sank. The others were all able to continue proceeding, until a follow-up attack managed to hit Fuse Maru again, but the ship still remained on the surface, albeit very slowly going down, and so Seawolf was forced to pop up and finish it off with a deck gun. By this stage, we were arriving in late 1943, and the torpedoes were finally beginning to work somewhat better. This allowed Seawolf to pick off two more targets before a quick refit, and then she arrived back on station at the start of 1944, where she bagged another four ships in quick succession, before heading back to the continental United States for a much more significant overhaul. Now that newer and more capable submarines were now operating in large numbers, Seawolf was switched to other duties for a time, conducting beach reconnaissance and carrying out what would today be called a Special Forces landing operation, along with a few resupply missions to various pockets of already landed troops. On the 21st of September 1944, she headed out with supplies and army passengers, some of whom were intended for a secret mission. By October the 3rd, the submarine was transiting near a surface force that had come under attack by the Japanese submarine RO-41, an attack which had resulted in the loss of the USS Shelton. This occurred in an area that was otherwise designated as a safe lane for friendly submarines, and so all known friendly subs in the area were ordered to signal their positions via radio. Three out of four submarines did so. Seawolf, however, did not for some reason. 
Possibly this was due to the nature of her mission, it requiring radio silence, or perhaps there was just something wrong with the radio. In either case, uh, shortly thereafter, a search aircraft from the escort carrier USS Midway, which would later become the St. Low, so that the name could be reused on the much larger fleet carrier, spotted a submarine that was in the process of diving. And despite the area's status as a safe area, the aircraft launched a bombing run and dropped a die marker. The escort destroyer Richard M. Rowell then showed up and located the submarine with sonar. The contact made no apparent moves to attack and sent out a series of Morse code pulses, possibly further backing the idea that the other communication methods were otherwise inoperable. But aboard RAL, the pulses didn't seem to match any known recognition signal in their book, and so concluding that this was some weird attempt at jamming their sonar, they attacked. Two salvos of hedgehog mortar rounds later, and there was a series of explosions and debris. Some days later, it turned out there had been no further communication from Seawolf following this incident, and thus it became very likely that she had become the second US submarine of World War II to fall victim to friendly fire. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.